All right, well, good morning, y'all. We are continuing the journey of Sermon on the Mount. I think we do need to give a hand clap for Pastor Don. I know he's not gonna like this, but last week, Pastor Don spoke on three just like really easy slam dunk topics. Um, that'd be lust, divorce, and oaths. So Don, that's why you're the OG, man. So I wanna remind us as we continue this series that it is crucial for us to understand that Jesus' teachings here in Sermon on the Mount are about the conditions of our hearts. This is a heart condition with the goal being to obey out of love for Jesus. For most of us, the Sermon on the Mount and maybe the Bible as a whole can read like this list that we need to follow, this list of things that we need to do, and a way to obey God as if our outward behavior, like following a list and the behavior that's affected, is the only thing that really matters. And while behavior is really important as a Christian, these teachings show us that our hearts must be conformed to those of God's children living in and under the kingdom of God. Because if you just try to follow the list of these teachings, they're gonna blow your mind and you're gonna think this is impossible. And the reality is it actually is impossible unless you understand that Jesus is talking about, no, these things flow from the heart and he is capturing his own heart for us. So we must have a desire we must have a hunger and a desire to be more like Jesus. If that's our one desire, if that's our one hunger to be more like him and live in a way that Jesus lived, it starts in these types of teachings. And we must understand that through Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying a foundation for how the kingdom of God operates. And the beginning of Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5 is this lens that we must look through and we need to see the kingdom of God through. So if you have your Bibles, you can open it to Matthew 5. If you have your phone, you can go there in the Bible app. We're gonna hang out just for a second. In Matthew 5, 7 through 10. Matthew 5, 7 through 10, we'll start in uh, verse 7. It says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. And God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So if you look at the last word in some of these scriptures, you'll see mercy, purity, peace, and righteousness. And these are the words that actually create this lens that capture the heart and the character of God. Those words capture the heart of God. So today we're going to examine Jesus's teachings on revenge and loving our enemies through the lens of God's heart. So Matthew 5, moving forward a little bit, 38 through 42, says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat to. If you, sorry, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Here we see Jesus capturing and revealing God's heart for how we are to treat those who wrong us by responding with mercy and peace. And it's always that simple, right? It's always simple to respond to people like that with mercy and peace. No, it's actually not. It's super difficult. But before we move forward, I do want to mention there's a few important things here. If a believer or a loved one is threatened or attacked, it is not 
wrong, to take up defense or to seek appropriate justice against the wrongdoer. And second is that by saying, do not resist an evil person, Jesus is not requiring us as believers to be pacifists or to never resist evil forces. In fact, scripture does command us in James and in 1 Peter to resist the devil and to flee from enemy and evil flee from evil practices. So that's part of this that we must understand. That's the, the entire uh, lens of scripture that we're working through. So, but the question is, what does Jesus require of us when we're personally wronged? Well, it's clear through these scriptures that what he requires is us for not to retaliate. Not to retaliate, especially as believers, and especially as we're wronged and when people hurt us. So as believers living as citizens of the kingdom of God, why do we not retaliate? I think sometimes we can almost get in our own heads about that, but the reality is we are able to reveal the heart of God. We are actually able to reveal the heart of God to people around us, especially those who have personally wronged us. Isn't that absolutely crazy? That the creator of the universe, the creator of the world sent his son for us. And then when we say yes to Jesus, we have the opportunity to reveal his heart to other people. What a high honor and what a high calling and in the same way, God chose to reveal his character to us when he sent his son for us while we were still in sin. We received mercy. We received peace from God in that moment when he offered his son, Jesus. In fact, he chose to bless us through his mercy. I also want you to know in these verses, when you spend time in them, that Jesus is not prohibiting through these words, the use of self-defense or even the use of force by governments, law enforcement, or soldiers when combating evil. But the reality is rather, the, the reality is Jesus' focus here is on our individual conduct as indicated by personal revenge. I've heard people talk about both sides of these scriptures, but the fact is Jesus is talking about personal revenge and a personal heart posture. So where are my sports fans at? If, if you're a sports fan here, just like throw up your hand. Give me, give me a yell, yeah? Sports fans. All right, so this is, this is what it looks like. Yeah, you know where we're going. All right, we're going there. So it's like if someone from the opposing team that you cheer for, the bad guys, does something unsportsmanlike. Yeah, I've already heard people shouting the Cowboys. I'm trying not to say it, okay? <laughs> we'll just say it's like someone from the opposing team does something unsportsmanlike to one of your people, right? So if the Ravens and the Steelers are playing football and you're a Ravens fan and someone on the Steelers does something, what we're getting at here is what bubbles up in your heart you want your guy to get revenge. You want your guy eye for an eye. You know what? Don't, don't be hit like that. Give it back to him. This is what Jesus is talking about. But you know what's crazy? The reality is for me personally, if someone does that to like an Eagles player, everything in my heart like doesn't only just want revenge. It's like, no, he just nudged you like, finish him. Like, that's the part of my heart that bubbles up, that personal vengeance that we all want. That is what Jesus is getting here, getting at here. And it's not just like, you can think in that moment, right? You, you get cloudy. It's like, oh my gosh, what am, you know, what, what is going on here? So we see Jesus saying, absolutely, don't go overboard and, and don't do these things on a sports field, for example, where 
someone nudges you and you, know, you nudge them back. Don't do those things and also don't go over the top. But for me, watching, it pulls something out of my heart that's dirty. It pulls something out of my heart that's messy. And Jesus is saying, don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. And the reason is, that's like a fun example to use, but what happens when it's like way more personal? What happens when the rubber actually meets the road in our personal lives where there's true hurt? The reality is that scripture actually still applies. It's kind of, you know, lighthearted to look and use an example of people on a professional sports field. But when it happens to us, that's when we really need to apply God's heart in those examples. So I've got another story. Um, I played hockey back in the day growing up, and then I played hockey in an adult league. And one time I was skating with the puck, and you know, as, like a, as a bigger guy on the ice, I've usually been like a target. It's like, you know, people wanna try to hit me. So I'm playing in a non-checking league, and I have the puck, I'm skating down the wing, and someone just comes up and like nails me, like hits me really hard. And my temper was absolutely through the roof. But here's the thing, that temper that was through the roof was like in my heart. It wasn't like I was yelling and screaming, but I knew I was gonna enact revenge on this person. So the puck went down to the opposite end. I see him and I take my stick and I slash him in the back of the leg. <laughs> Terrible, right? Here's the reality. I was actually saved when I did that. I was saved when I did that and everything in me just wanted revenge. There was no thinking through the lens of Jesus. There was no thinking through these scriptures. So the official gives me a 10 minute misconduct. I go to the penalty box, which in hockey is called the sin bin, believe it or not. <laughs> I go there and of course I know the scorekeeper. So the scorekeeper takes out his phone and takes a picture of me. I'm like, Are you? come on man. So I get to the locker room after this happened. I look at my phone, open up Facebook, and here's what I see on Facebook. Not that, that. <laughs> so my buddy sends the picture to Kristen, and Kristen, without knowing what actually happened, posts it on Facebook. So it's like she knows, you know, oh, this isn't good. This is something, you know, lighthearted. But the reality is I absolutely lost my cool. And she posts it with the caption without even talking to me with the question, is Dustin even saved when he plays hockey? <laughs> so I think she was kind of kidding. But in that moment, it was like, you know, the Lord has a sense of humor. But I absolutely lost my cool. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, Dustin, you are such an idiot. You are such an idiot. Like, what if this kid, you know, attends living room? Or what if this kid is, is a part of church? You know, I, I just, but do you see how easy it is to, like, lose your cool in that moment? That's why these scriptures and these teachings, like, I wasn't just going to go to a list if that teaching was truly on my heart, truly embedded in me at that time, I'm thinking I might have actually responded differently. I know now I would have responded differently. That's what Jesus is talking about. When we respond in mercy and peace, we live like true children of God in God's kingdom. You know, we use the driving example a lot. You know, if you get cut off in your driving, it's like everything in you is just like, how dare you? How dare you? But what is that? Why do we go there right away? It's annoying and it gets under my skin too. But Jesus loves that person. That's the reality of it. Jesus absolutely loves that person. So we're gonna continue Matthew 5, 43 through Matthew 5, 43 through 45. It says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil 
and the good. And he sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. And what Jesus is saying here completely flips the narrative that people might have known in that time and culture. And in fact, it also completely flips the narrative that we have and that we're living in right now. Think about what kingdomship looks like. It looks like royalty and power and influence and rulers and kings at the time were feared and respected and accomplished and they certainly didn't love their enemies. In fact, how hard they were on their enemies actually is what gave them clout. They were vicious. And Jesus' enemies viewed him that way. They absolutely despised him despised him and hated him. And here comes Jesus, who actually was the one that possesses all power and all authority, fully God, fully man. And what is he doing? He's teaching that God's blessings look like a heart rooted in mercy, purity, peace, and righteousness. And how did he do it? He offered his other cheek. He took off his garments. He walked the extra mile. He did all of those things and prayed for those who persecuted him unto death. All power and all authority to call down angels. And he didn't do it. His lens of the kingdom was completely rooted in this heart of God. And what he did with that lens was completely surrender to the will of God. So in those moments when I'm fed up or I'm, you know, playing an intramural sports game or I want revenge in my heart, is my lens and my heart posture completely surrendered to what the will of God would want in that moment? Lots of times it's not. See, understanding the kingdom of God requires a different thought process. It requires a different mindset. It's the biblical worldview of what the kingdom is. And this is that mindset, that it is not all about us. (laughs) It sounds simple until we start to realize we make it about ourselves all the time. I know I do. We must submit our way to the Lord's way and come under his authority in the same way that Jesus did to the Father. It's an aspect that's really easy to drift away from and that's an aspect that the enemy is just wanting to pull away from us. But the reality is that God offers salvation for all people. He offers salvation for all people and our enemies are included. Think about that. They're included. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church and he's explaining how we are God's ambassadors. And he goes on and he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Verse 15, he died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And he goes on and says in verse 16, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. 
And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. This is really easy to miss. And we need a kingdom mindset to understand this. But we must love our enemies because God has given us the task of reconciling people to Christ. That's what it boils down to. The ministry of reconciliation. The process by which God and man are brought together through Jesus. It's only through his blood. That's how we are reconciled to God. And as children of God, we are actually tasked with this standard that he left for us to be reconciled with God and be reconciled with one another. Now we can't change people's hearts. Only the Holy Spirit can change a heart. Which means that some people don't actually want to be reconciled. So what we do is we love them where they're at. And we don't force reconciliation. There needs to be two sides, two willing sides of reconciliation. There are times when our enemies, they won't want to reconcile with us. Maybe they're choosing evil. Maybe they're practicing evil, and that's okay. We must release them to the Lord. Release them to the Lord. But as we model his ministry of reconciliation through the power of the Holy Spirit, the reality is the world will actually be impacted by the church. The world will be impacted through the church. Because if we are truly followers of Jesus, we will truly want our enemies in the kingdom of God. That must be our heart posture. We must be a church that helps others find peace and relationship with Jesus. That must be what moves us making it about other people, not always making it only about ourselves. Because when we truly understand what we've actually been saved from, we will want our enemies celebrating in heaven with us. And what that does is create a burden on our hearts, a compassion on our hearts for people. It's the same compassion that moved Jesus. That is kingdom culture. In Acts 6, there's a man introduced named Stephen. The Bible says he is full of faith and he is full of the Holy Spirit. And later he's arrested and forced to appear before a council. This council that despised Jesus' followers, a council that despised Jesus, his disciples, apostles. And in Acts 7, Stephen gives this beautiful monologue, this beautiful testimony. It goes on for more than 60 verses, and it's one of the most detailed and moving accounts of the history of God's relationship with Israel ever recorded, in my opinion. We see Stephen is under extreme pressure. He's under severe persecution, true persecution, like being killed for the name of Jesus, being killed for the gospel, beaten and abused and all the things that came with that kind of persecution. And he's passionately sharing this account and this monologue. And we'll pick it up in Acts 7, verse 52 through 60. Stephen 
It says, name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusations and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God as he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Picture this. He saw the glory of God in the middle of this betrayal and persecution. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and they began shouting. They rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting. What did he shout? Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. This is what loving our enemies looks like. And this is what it looked like for the early church. Lord, don't charge them with this sin as they viciously beat him and murder him through stoning. That's the heart of Jesus. It's the heart of what we must have to be children of God. It's the same heart that Jesus had when Jesus is getting nailed to the cross and he says, forgive them for they don't know what they do. It's mercy and it's peace. And the next verse, it actually says that Saul was one of the witnesses and he completely agreed with the killing of Stephen. Well, a little bit later, we see Saul heading out to persecute the church. The Bible says that a great wave of persecution started that day and Saul led it. But what do we see in the story of Saul? We see a dramatic encounter with the Lord where the Lord shows up and it completely changes his life. He's made into a brand new creation. So the words that we just read about reconciliation in Corinthians are from somebody who sat at the feet and saw a brutal execution of Stephen. And the Lord shows up and says, why do you persecute me, Saul? And he's responsible for a bunch of the New Testament. And he realized, I am persecuting Jesus and his followers in the heart of God. And he received it. He 
He wrote those powerful words about reconciliation. He knows what it looks like to not be reconciled together. It is one of the most powerful examples of how the kingdom of God operates. We all get to play a part in it. This is mercy. This is purity. This is peace. This is righteousness. This is loving our enemies. This is the kingdom of God. And it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit in us that we can love our enemies and not take revenge into our own hands. Here's the thing I realize. It is hard to view people and view others through the lens of Jesus when you've been hurt. I know that. But the reality is Jesus wants to heal that in your heart. And he wants you to lay that burden down at the foot of the cross where you can experience freedom and you can experience healing. So if you are here and you have a burden on your heart, there's something that you feel weight from. There's a weight that needs lifted. I want to invite you to the front. In just a few minutes, we're going to have a prayer team down here. The altar doesn't save you. Only Jesus can save. But the reality is, it's a posture that we take of submission when we come down to an altar and meet Jesus in the presence of God there. That's what happened to me when I was 24 years old. Those are the steps that I took. I felt the Holy Spirit nudging and moving on my heart. And I said yes to Jesus in the same way There's things that are moving and nudging on our hearts that we need healing in. And I want that moment to be right now. So let's stand to our feet. Prayer team, can you come down to the front? If you are carrying a burden that needs released, I want you to come down for prayer. Only Jesus can release that type of burden. If you're feeling a weight, if you were wronged, if you want to be reconciled, please come down to the front and let the Lord heal you. If you don't come down, let's just stay in our seats and you can pray there. But give it to the Lord and ask for healing. His desire for us is reconciliation and it will always be. As we close this morning, if you still feel a tugging on your heart, don't let this opportunity pass you by. The prayer team's gonna stay down here. There are people still praying. So you can still come down to the front to pray. Also, you know, if you have never made the decision to follow Jesus, or you need to make a recommitment to following Jesus, something that I would say is that's the best decision you can ever make. It is absolutely the best decision. But the reality is if you want this heart, it's the only decision to make. It's the only decision. It's Jesus and it's always been. So if you are here and you want to make a decision or recommitment, Put your hand in the air boldly if you want to make a recommitment to follow him or you want to follow Jesus for the first time. Our ushers have Bibles for you. You can take that Bible back to connections and people are there that would love to talk with you. Can we just give praise to Jesus this morning? We thank you, Lord, for the healing that is happening. Thank you for the healing, Jesus. 
If you received the Bible or maybe you have in the past, your next step is water baptism. You can sign up. It's a class that we have here at WC. You can find out more at Connections on that. If you're here for the first time, also you can stop by Connections. Well, Jesus is good. Amen. Amen. Please, if there's a burden on your heart, come down for prayer. All right? Let's stay connected this week and have an awesome week.